Hi, I'm Mike, owner of the Ingroup in Phoenix, Arizona. Today I'm doing another news update video, a few bits of news, and then I also wanted to talk about some records that I've been listening to. Kind of give you some quick thoughts and a review on some recent audio file releases. The first bit of news I wanted to mention is Mobile Fidelity has announced they are opening up a new pressing plant, which is actually monumental news. One of the biggest reasons is because it's going to actually get a lot of their catalog back into print. I think about it, and I want to say... I've got about, I got Nielsen Schmielsen in stock. I got one of the super vinyl titles in stock, the uh, Eldorados in stock. I've got the Rascals in stock. That's all that's in stock. If you come into my store and you're asking for brand new current imprint mobile fidelity titles, that's it. Their catalog probably has over 100 titles in it. I mean, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but 50 to 100, I mean, it's, it's been so long since I've had a chunk of them in the store. It's hard to even tell. But currently, the way it sits, everything that they do is pressed and done at RTI in California. They're a California-based company as well. So they're going to be opening up their own California-based plant. So it's kind of a two-part benefit. So take all that pressing capacity for One Steps and other MoFi titles they've done. Open that back up for other labels, like Universal to do Tone Poets, for instance. And now it's kind of a win-win for everybody. So there should be more mobile fidelity product in stock. We should get less delays on other titles, you would think, Tone Poets, stuff of that nature. So I think of this as a big win-win. If you look at Analog Productions, who has their own pressing plant, QRP, there is actually a significant amount of Analog Productions titles in stock. I've got 20, 30, 40 titles of theirs in stock. But when it comes to mobile fidelity, that's just not been something that's been able to happen for since the pre-pandemic before I had a grip of mobile fidelity titles in stock. I mean, it's been a long time. So that's a big bit of news. I did a video on John Coltrane's Blue Train as a tone poet a couple, maybe three weeks ago. It was announced that it's going to be a tone poet. I asked for rumors, speculation, you know, your guys' opinions. So we kind of know exactly what it's going to be now. So Kevin Gray, who does all the mastering for the Tone Poets series, all analog from the original master tape, has come out and pretty much given us all the details. They are coming out in September. It is going to be three discs, essentially. We're going to have a dedicated mono Blue Train Tone Poet. Then we're going to have a two-disc Tone Poet, which is going to be the stereo disc, and then unreleased stuff. That's what he labeled it as, unreleased. So that's pretty much, that's everything, <laughs> That's all we have. That's now we know. So two separate SKUs. If you want a mono mix, great. If you want a stereo mix, great. I love this idea for a few reasons. I think this is going to be just such a monumental home run. I really think this is going to make them kind of rethink doing other titles in mono. I mentioned in that video I'd like to see some other stuff done in mono, even though it's considered fold downs by the late 50s. Rudy Van Gelder only recorded true mono and stereo, I think, for a couple of months. Then he switched everything to stereo, and then all the subsequent monos were fold-downs. Although they are extremely desirable with Blue Note collectors. I know a lot of people think that's crazy. But uh, mono mix, in a lot of cases, is preferred. Although, you know, the master tape is stereo. So kind of two ways of looking at it. So yeah, September. Oddly enough, he kind of spoiled all of those details, but we don't have any word. I mean, there's been no official announcement, but he had to... I doubt Kevin is pumping that information into the wild without running it by somebody. You know, they, these guys, Joe, Harley, Kevin Gray, these guys kind of trickle things out in breadcrumbs. Kind of, you know, I'm sure this is run by marketing or this you would think is run by somebody to where he's not just coming out and shooting his mouth off. Because in that same interview, he was talking about uh, all the stuff he couldn't discuss. So it wasn't like, I can't discuss anything, but let me tell you about this blue train. So you would think this is all... You know, this was all clear. Makes me wonder where the release date is. I mean, September's close. I mean, you know, it's end of June. September's two-ish months away. So I'm thinking, I mean, we are probably to the point now, any day now, within a week or two. Universal typically does a couple of months notice, at least two to three months Heads up. I mean, I've always noticed that from them as far as opportunity for pre-order. That seems to be, now sometimes it's longer than that. But if they're coming out in September, you would think they're going to have to announce it really, really soon. Okay. A couple of new arrivals. Finally got these in the store. If you pre-ordered them, I started shipping them already. Probably already shipped all of them. But uh, yeah, 
two against nature and everything must go. The last two Steely Dan albums. I have to start off by saying I'm not a huge Steely Dan fan. For me, the perfect Steely Dan album would be like a greatest hits album, you know, and uh, I could be fine with that. But one thing I will say about all Steely Dan records are they are extremely well recorded. When I did that Steely Dan Asia shootout, I mean, it was mind-boggling difficult to do because between the best and the worst, I mean, they're still exceptionally well recorded. So the mastering, I mean, you would have to work pretty hard to screw up the mastering on that album. And it's only, it's happened a couple times. But for the most part, all the Steely Dan reissues were done really well. What's nice is the last two albums are extremely difficult to get. So I had to compare them against stuff that I had in my collection. I have, this is an original Everything Must Go, originally came out in Germany. Uh, I have the Record Store Day reissue, which was the second time it's ever been done. And this is the third time it's ever been done. So we've really only got three issues of this. And we've gotten three issues of this. The original came out in, what was this, 2000 this record came out? 2000. The original, the Record Store Day, and now this. Uh, Everything Must Go, I'm pretty sure, is analog, cut from uh, the master tape by Bernie Grunman. Two Against Nature, according to Analog Productions, was recorded analog, mixed down digitally, and cut from a digital file. I will say this. The original, especially for the dark era of vinyl, when almost everything sounded like crap because they just could care too less about vinyl lovers, you know, the major labels. Now, there was always audiophile labels. And that was a different thing. But if you get a lot of, like, modern releases from this time period, they're typically pretty crummy. That's not the case with this. This is actually an extremely good-sounding record. So when I put this on, I was like, man, this is going to be really tough to best. And I will say it was. Uh, I heard the Record Store Day pressings when they came out. The problem with the Record Store Day pressings, and this was widely reported, is they were extremely crummy pressings. The mastering good, was good, and the sound quality was really good. But I want to say about 40% of the people I talked to said theirs had either popped clicks or a whooshing. So those are probably not something I would target if you don't have them by now. But I would say that as a whole, they're really good. I mean, the original was really good. I don't have an original of Two Against Nature, but I do have the original of Everything Must Go. But the original was really good. The Record Store Day version was really good. But I would say that this is slightly better than all of them. Uh, but as opposed to the Record Store Day, you're getting a crummy pressing. But we're talking mass, right? Pressing this is lights better than both of them. But this is in print, and I mean, look what you're getting. I mean, look at that. Beautiful tip-on jacket, heavy-duty gloss. I mean, that's awesome. I mean, and it's in print. Originals, I mean, uh, two against nature is a lot less money, but the original of Everything Must Go, this is probably two to four hundred bucks. Even with all these represses, I mean, that's an expensive album. And extremely rare. Uh, same thing. I mean, the quality of these, just like any Analog Productions title. Well, not any. All of the modern Analog Productions title use these really heavy-duty Stoughton. Uh, you know, I'm assuming they're Stoughton. They could be made somewhere else now. I know there's a lot of, there's some competition out there on companies making these tip-on jackets. Hence, the new Tone Poets aren't made by Stoughton, I don't believe, anymore. But... Look at the quality of that. I mean, that's the new analog production stuff, cover-wise, has typically been just out of the ballpark. Uh, I'm talking about, like, the old Elvis 24 karat gold that hits, the original Blue Note series stuff that analog productions did. They use those cheap, flimsy covers. But all their modern stuff uses that really nice, heavy tip-on jacket. So for what it is, the price it is, 60 bucks. I mean, these are extremely good. Uh, I only listen to, you know... I did a quick little review of it because, like I said, I mean, I, I don't think I could have sat through too much, too much listening of everything must go. I mean, I think even if you're a Steely Dan fan, I talk to Steely Dan fans, they're like, oh, yeah, I love Steely Dan. Well, you know, that last album, that's not their best. That's the nice way of saying this isn't a good album in the grand scheme of things. Who knows? What else was coming out in 2003 when this came out? It probably was great. But, yeah. The other one was... Alan Parsons' Eye in the Sky. This is a record, so a little bit of an issue with this one, if you ordered it from me. Uh, I got a good chunk of these. Most people got them. Most, uh, I won't say most, but a large, ch I had enough to, for pre-orders, and then I was going to have some to sell. But a lot of the copies I got, 
are pretty damaged. We're talking five inch seam splits, bashed up corners. Uh, I'm guessing UPS played football with my package and uh, packages, but unfortunately, no replacements until the second pressing. But yeah, I put this on and this is an album that's just notoriously good sounding. All Alan Parsons stuff was the man was in it. Sound engineer responsible for engineering. You know, I think he let it be uh, dark side of the moon. I mean, the man could record sound quite well, right? So you'd expect all of his albums to sound good and they do. This is no exception. I put this on and I thought to myself, yeah, that's really good, but I wonder if this is going to be much better than my Speaker's Corner copy, which I've always loved. I have an original around here somewhere. I feel it's in a box. I don't know what I did with it. But yeah, here's the Speaker's Corner copy. And I put it on and I was just kind of thinking to myself, oh man, I was like not too excited about it because from memory, the Speaker's Corner sounded that good and the original sounded that good. Put this on and I, yeah, it's fantastic. I'm like digging it, I'm digging it. And then I put the speaker's corner on right afterwards, kind of expecting a similar experience. And I was, man, I was so disappointed because this is such a great sounding record, but comparing the two to, together, and this is just, it doesn't have the low end. Obviously the mobile fidelity at 45 is cut a lot hotter and it should be, although that's not always the case. The Eric Clapton Unplugged was cut significantly lower. And I think almost to its detriment, the Eric Clapton Unplugged one step, one of the only one steps that have actually been cut low. But this, even volume matching with the dB meter, right? This has significantly goosed up upper end. You don't get as much. It's kind of almost slopey in the way you think about the way this is mastered. I mean, the low end is weak. It gets a little bit more pumpy in the middle and then the top end is just so over embellished compared to this mofi this mofi is so rich and so sweet i mean this is really a killer sounding record i put them back back and forth back and forth I thought, man holy cow they knocked it out of the park with this one and a great record too uh i get excited every time i listen to this record it might be just because you know i get flashbacks of watching michael jordan take the court you know, those are good times, good childhood times, fond memories. But uh, this was actually a really pleasant surprise. One thing I will say about this, they did a little changing. They changed their wording on this a little bit. Let me see if I can find a slightly older record. So on the bottom now, it says limited, or excuse me, special edition. I want to say, this is Derek and the Dominos. Yeah, this... Old terminology was special numbered edition. So it used to say special numbered edition. Now it just says on the back, limited, excuse me, special edition. I don't know why they took off that numbered, but there's two forms of mobile fidelity and the old form doesn't really exist too much at the standard level. And that is numbered to a specific amount. Like the Rascals, they're only making 5,000 of those. Once those 5,000 are sold, they don't essentially have a license to do any more. And you really couldn't because it's numbered on the bottom and it says of 5,000. It'd be a little bit weird if we started seeing like 6,452, right? That'd be a little awkward. Although that hasn't stopped them in the past from doing super vinyl versions. But plenty, plenty more of these are gonna come as well as everything else. You know, I think back to round out back to the beginning with Mobile Fidelity opening up their new plant, you gotta think they put out essentially like what they said was a five year schedule of one steps. We're talking, what was it, 30, 40 one steps they announced? And you would say, I would say, what, what's the rate of one steps? Maybe five a year we're seeing? 50 one steps, I mean, that's almost like, it's like a 10 year plan at the current rate. So you could see that this was something that was really needed, especially considering we got titles like Michael Jackson Thrillers coming with 50,000 copies. So this plant was something that they probably, when they released this list, kind of had in the back of their mind that they, had huge pressing capacity coming online because they've got some heater titles coming. Michael Jackson's Thriller, uh, Hotel California, some of the Van Halen stuff, all the Miles Davis stuff is gonna just sell like absolute gangbusters. So they really needed to get compress pressing capacity up. And it is nice to actually have titles in stock. 
people used to come for the last two years. They'd come into the store. Hey, Mike, where do you where do you keep your mobile fidelity se- you know titles? Where's the mobile fidelity section? I'm like, there is no mobile fidelity section. I have zero mobile fidelity titles in the store. You know, and I always have old stuff that's out of print. But that's not what they're asking for. They're not asking for you know where's the uh, you know three hundred dollar Queen night at the opera or you know the higher price stuff. They want to know where the reasonable in print retail price stuff is. And for two years, there's been nothing. Like I said, I got three titles now, but I really hope that's going to be a huge change. But yeah, check us out on the line at the website, theingroove.com. Until next time.